Well, good evening. It gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome you tonight to the King Institute for Faith and Culture. My name is Martin Dodderweich, and I am director of the King Institute of Faith and Culture at King University here in Bristol, where I also teach history. And it is a delight particularly to have you tonight because this event has been long in the making. We were interrupted by a global pandemic. We were interrupted by some other travel plans. And so this is the fourth date that we have attempted with Malcolm. As you will discover, it is completely worth the wait. I have a couple of announcements and then I'll introduce Malcolm to you. And uh, uh, first of all, I wanna mention what we have coming up. Tomorrow morning, he's gonna speak at King. This will be on uh, general themes of theology and the imagination. That'll be in the King College Chapel at 9.15 tomorrow morning. So if you want, and you will want more Malcolm at the end of this evening, come at 9.15 tomorrow morning to hear him uh, to do a lecture there. Um, then I have the unique ability tonight to do something I've never done from the front, which is to introduce you to our next speaker because he's here. This is Jeff Monroe. Uh, Jeff is going to be our Frederick Buechner lecturer on Monday. Every year we have honored Frederick Buechner's work uh, with an annual lectureship. This year we have Jeff, who is the author of Reading Buechner, a highly personal and accessible account of reading through Buechner's work, uh, which I commend highly. We'll have that on sale on Monday. He's also going to lead some of us in a discussion, and you're very welcome to this, of Buechner's well-known memoir, The Sacred Journey. And we'll do that at, on Sunday at 4 p.m. in the Tadlock House at King, whether you've read the book or not, feel free to come along. It's a beautiful book and one that is turning 40 this year. So in honor of the 40th anniversary of The Sacred Journey, we're going to have a discussion of that on Sunday. Jeff will speak at 9.15 in the King College Chapel, and he will speak again at 7 p.m. at Central Presbyterian Church. We'd love to have you uh, at any of those events uh, commemorating the life and work of Fred and, uh, and his tremendous influence on King and American Christianity generally. Uh, and that is the final event for this year. It's been an, a strange year. We've had lots of rescheduling, but it's been a good year. If you are new to the King Institute, please, at the end, be sure that you get one of these handy bookmarks, which we did this year knowing that we were going to change dates. We didn't do a brochure. If you will let your phone see the QR code, it'll bring up our whole schedule for the year, and uh, you can then add us onto your favorites list. You can like us on Facebook, and you can see what's coming next year. We have another... We have Next year's not quite finished yet, but it's going to be another exciting year, and I hope many of you will be able to join us for these events. After we have uh, an evening of poetry and song here, uh, Malcolm will take some time for discussion and questions. If you want to buy books, we have lots of books, and those books are available at the other entrance. There's, uh, uh, in order to, to make this work seamlessly, the books are in a different place, but you can go there, buy several and then come back in here and Malcolm will sign them for you uh, if you like at the end. So we, if you are interested in books at the end, and I hope you will be, you go through that door, follow the hallway downstairs and you'll see the book table there waiting for you. And I hope you'll uh, avail yourself of that at the end. I'll remind you again at the end uh, of that possibility. Malcolm was born in Nigeria and he bounced around between Nigeria, England and Canada uh, through his youth. He is a graduate of Cambridge University. He uh, did his PhD at Durham University. He has worked as a secondary school teacher. He has worked as a parish priest, and he has worked at Cambridge teaching uh, literature as well as theology, and also serving as chaplain of Girton College, Cambridge. Along the way, he started writing poems, and he may, start to, he may tell us some more about that process tonight, but he's written poems and songs for a very long time, and they have now seen fruition in numerous books, uh, some of which are available, as well as CDs. Um, and we have, uh, you have access to some of his music. If you have Apple Music or Spotify, just look up Malcolm and you'll find uh, a wonderful playlist of his songs, some of which you will hear tonight. Um, it is a great pleasure to welcome Malcolm. It is a great pleasure to have you here. Please join me in welcoming Malcolm Kite. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for that very kind introduction. It's great to be here. Uh, I've had a lovely time already. I mean, I, I went into one of Martin's classes. We had a good time there. He's taken me to the birthplace of Country Music Museum, which is wonderful. And um, 
I, I, I love that music, so this is great. Uh, this opening poem mentions music. It's about listening. It's about stilling. It can maybe just bring us down. It's, a, it's the title poem of a, a book called The Singing Bowl. And, um, you know, in, in the olden days, as it were, when poets were beginning a great work, they would invoke the muse. I mean, Virgil famously says, you know, of arms and the man sing. He more or less snaps his finger and tells the muse to come down and get going. Um, I felt that in, in modern times, you know, middle-aged white poet snapping his fingers and saying, hey, muse, what's cooking tonight? <laughs> uh, I think the, the hey, good-looking, what you got cooking doesn't quite work these days. <laughs> so I, I figured maybe I should do it the other way around. Maybe I should open my book with me sitting down and finally listening to what she has to say. So these are kind of the words of my muse to me about what it is to write poetry, what we need. I thought I was writing a poem about getting ready to write a poem. It turned out to be about prayer as well. And that's been the heart of my own journey spiritually, was that the journey into poetry had to open up to something bigger spiritually. Eventually, I read a line in a poem by Seamus Heaney which said, read poems as prayers. And the poetic and the priestly side of my life kind of came together. But anyway, here's this opener, singing bowl. Not me snapping my fingers for the muse. She almost inevitably says, not tonight, I'm washing my hair. You know, I sit there, I wait. <laughs> but, uh, but the muse telling me what I need to do. But maybe this will tell you something too about your own vocation and being the person you are in the place you are. So singing bowl. Begin the song exactly where you are. Remain within the world of which you're made. Call nothing common in the earth or air. Accept it all and let it be for good. Start with the very breath you breathe in now, this moment's pulse, this rhythm in your blood and listen to it ringing soft and low. Stay with the music. Words will come in time. Slow down your breathing. Keep it deep and slow. Become an open singing bowl whose chime is richness rising out of emptiness and timelessness resounding into time. And when the heart is full of quietness, begin the song exactly where you are. So um, I call tonight Songs and Sonnets. So that's a sonnet. Um, so I figure I need a song now. Uh, and as it says, uh, begin the song exactly where you are, or I guess I better follow instructions. So I'm going to play a song. Uh, it'll probably be more poetry than song, and you may be relieved to hear that. Uh, by the end of this one, but there you go. Uh, how can I be in the birthplace of country music and not strap on a guitar? How can I have listened to Mother Carter and all those things in the museum today and not want, except I can't pick like her. I, I, you know. But I want to, um, I, I have to say, you know, Oscar Wilde said that, uh, that England and America were two countries divided by a common language. Um, uh, and I know we're country cousins, eh? But I, there are differences, and there. But I tell you one thing: whatever the differences, I, I'm always astonished and delighted by the hospitality I receive in America. You guys really know how to do welcome and come on home, and you know, sharing the plate. So um, I love hospitality. I love what it means. One of my favourite passages, just as a throwaway verse in the Bible, it's Hebrews 13. I love that thing where. In the writer of the Hebrews says, um, practice hospitality, for by so doing, some have entertained angels unawares. And of course, he's riffing on the story of Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre, Abraham and Sarah in the desert, exhausted, everything's going wrong, coming to the end of their tether, like they've hardly got enough to go, they've had this big promise that they're going to have his seed, but he's, he's past it, and she's way, way past childbearing, and like, What's going to happen here? And then wouldn't you know it, in the middle of all of that, three strangers turn up needing food, you know? And they kill the last couple. 
entertain these three angels, remember? And they say, uh, oh, don't worry, the promise is going to come true. And uh, Sarah laughs, like, oh, yeah, tell me, pull the other one. And then, of course, the child, the promised child comes, and they call him Isaac, which means laughter. So that's what some have entertained angels unawares. But I just thought, that's just a great phrase. Angels unawares. I, you know, angels are supposed to be super intelligent beings. How can they be unaware? But no, I actually like that. I like that people might become angels unawares. And so I, um, I decided to write this song. It's just called Angels Unawares. Some people say that life is just a given thing. But you and I both know by whom it's lent and that it's right here in the dirt where we've all been loved and heard that love himself has come to pitch his tent sometimes we're in the fields of holy roses other times we're rolling in the tears, but breaking bread, sharing wine, did I feel your hand touch mine, or did we both touch angels unawares? Abraham is down by the oaks at Mamre, Joseph dreams beside empty barn and there's a woman by the well with dreams no man can tell though a broken man might keep her safe from harm there's somebody else inside my fiery furnace and Jacob is gazing up those endless stairs we are all wounded on this road but we share each other's load and we make each other angels unaware everybody backs into the future everyone is just Feeling for it blind And sometimes we get lost All the threads of our lives get crossed But I'm sure glad yours got tangled up with mine Day is gone and I know I should be going Barely light enough to say our prayers. Ah, but give me leave the while for to turn and see you smile and leave to love like angels unaware. Leave to love like angels unaware. So um, that's for all of you who've been hospitable to me and been the angels. <laughs> angels unawares. You'll see from that that um, I kind of like country music. So <laughs> you know, I'm very, I'm very glad, glad to be here. Um, I love, I love the sonnet as a form. I love, I love the idea that that it's concentrated, that it has a bounding line, that it has an end. You can kind of see, I mean, for people who are worried about poetry, it's kind of a merciful thing. You can see when it's going to stop before you start. <laughs> Speaking of which, I mean, I kind of congratulate you on your courage in coming out to a poetry evening. So that's quite a big ask. I mean, it's partly because poetry took a very weird turn after T.S. Eliot and um, kind of... <laughs> It's a bit like art after Picasso, you know, or music after Strindberg. It's, it's like 
let's throw out all the rules, let's throw out the beauty, the order, the harmony, let's make these weird little confessional, fragmented, jarring, inward jottings, and hey, as long as the words don't reach the end of the page, it's a, it's a poem, you know. <laughs> I mean, Eliot famously said at one point that poetry in the modern age had to be difficult, and some people made the unfortunate assumption that, that if it's difficult, it must be poetry. <laughs> uh, that doesn't compute. I love Eliot, by the way. He also said true poetry communicates before it's understood. It's got to give you something. But I realize that there's that. As it happens, I'm the counterculture to that. I'm the other thing. I love the music. You remember that? The poem I just read you, it said, stay with the music. Words will come in time. I fell in love with poetry. The thing that made me want to be a poet was standing, dragged there by an aunt who thought I should be improved by culture. I didn't even want to be there. I was in Keats's house in Hampstead. And for the first time in my life, I read The Ode to a Nightingale in the very room that it was written, right? And I was, I was like a moody adolescent. I was really deeply annoyed and just down. And I just, like, I had nothing better to do while my aunt looked at the exhibit, so I start reading this random poem on the wall. And it's a very unpromising opening to an English poem. You remember, it begins, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and Lethe Woods had sunk. And I'm reading this and I'm going, oh man, I know where you're coming from, like, <laughs> dull, <laughs> dull, empty, drains, drunk, sunk, man, yeah. But of course, that's only the opening. Suddenly, Keats hears the nightingale. You remember, after Lethe Woods had sunk, if that had been the end of the poem, <coughs> he could have been in a punk band. But, you know, uh, which punk also rhymes with drunk and sunk, so you're there. But the poem doesn't end there. Do you remember how it goes on? Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in a full-throated ease. And I'm stood on going like, what is that? That's amazing, melodious plot of beech and green and shadows. And I followed into that poem and I heard the music of English poetry. And when I, I thought, I want to do that. I mean, I was reading Keats. I, the way I read Keats, I was like the kid at the back of the Eric Clapton concert playing air guitar, you know. It's like, <laughs> I want to do that. Like, how do I get that sound? I have no idea what I'm doing. So I had a long apprentice. I started that at 16. I didn't publish anything until I was 50. So it took me quite a long time to learn my chops, as the musicians would say. But I was listening for a sound and for a certain kind of music. I had to listen to lots of other poets, too, to get there. But that sound was kind of lost post Eliot. So one yeah. reason why people find poetry difficult, is it kind of lost its m music. Um, so I want to get the music back in. That's one of the things I'm doing. But I'll tell you another reason why, why people might find, oh my goodness, it's poetry, I don't want to know, is it doesn't always get taught well in schools. I, I mean, let me immediately apologize. There may be some great English teachers here. And there may be some people who had great English teachers here. I had a great English teacher who showed me how Keats did it, showed me what iambic pentameter was, got me into the whole technique and craft of it. You know, I'm very grateful. But I know there are teachers who do poetry or do Shakespeare <laughs> with classes where, where you just feel, they make you feel like an idiot. They read something and you're just beginning to have your first tremulous, glimmering response. And you say, maybe, maybe, and they say, no, that's wrong. And they, you know, <laughs> The kind of poet, your great American poet, Billy Collins, is the, the Texas Poet Laureate. He's got a great poem about um, how awful that was, where he goes, um, he talks about the teacher, says, her idea was uh, you tie the poem to a chair and you beat it with a hose pipe till it confesses what it meant. <laughs> you know, by contrast, Billy Collins in the poem says, I wanted to put my ear up to the murmuring hive of the poem and wonder what honey the innumerable bees of its words were making. You know, I wanted to step down to the canoe of the poem, untie the painter and float, you know. 
teach. So I have to say, just before we go any further, for those of you that might be here under sufferance, um, if lingering, so I'm going to, I'm, well, I'm in a church, I'm a priest, I'm ordained, I think I could now perform a minor exorcism. If, <laughs> if lingering on the edges and borders of your mind is the unrested grey shade of that bad English teacher who made you feel you couldn't do poetry and it wasn't for you, can I just say to that unrested shade, depart now, go to the place appointed for you and never return. <laughs> so... So that's that, um, that bad teacher in eternal detention. And uh, I want you to feel like it's playtime for the rest of the evening. I want you to feel like you can enjoy the poems. So I'm attracted to the sonnet because it's musical, because it has a form, and because mercifully you can see the end, you know, from the beginning. And um, I was a parish priest in a church in Cambridge where we were looking for ways to enrich and enhance our liturgy. And we had the idea, of course, we always preached from the gospel. In that sense, we stood under the word of God. We expanded what was given. But we wanted to bring that into conversation with the world around us. We didn't want to turn our church into a museum. So I had the task of finding a so-called secular reading that would be in conversation with the gospel and bring it into... And I sort of started running out of options and thought, well, maybe I could write one of these, you know. And I started writing sonnets responding to the gospels of the year. And these got brought out in church. And eventually on an early morning service when nothing else was happening, I just read the sonnet. And um, one of the people came up to me after and said, Malcolm, that was great. She said, I've been preaching there for about two years by then, you know, sometimes lengthy sermons. And they came up and said, Malcolm, why didn't you tell us you could do it in just 14 lines? <laughs> like... like so I started to get these things down into, into these things, and it was a book called Sounding the Seasons. Now, I have to say, I didn't come here with a set list, and I'm very glad I have a roving microphone, because I've been admiring, I don't know, how many people here are from this church? Or no, just, just give me a, so a few of you know this, know this place. If you don't know this place, look around you, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. And um, I was looking around, and because I wrote my poems out of a church setting, a communal setting. That's what liberated me, frankly, as a poet, from writing these tiny, narrow, confessional, weird, twisted <coughs> little things that is supposed to be modern poetry. Your great American poet, Stephen Spender, once said that there was a crisis in poetry. He said, the image of the poet is the bird that sings, the nightingale or the eagle that spreads its wings. And he said, in modern times, the poet's not allowed to fly over the whole public realm and sing about everything. The poet is in a cage. And then he said this, the bird is in the cage, and the bars of the cage are made of strips of min mirror facing inwards. All the poet is allowed to write about is fragmented images of the self. I grew up in that kind of poetic realm, and I thought, I'm not having this. I want to open the cage door. I don't want to be a narrow, weird, minor, kind of twisted, confessional poet. I want to be a bard. I want to be the one who utters the thoughts of his community who tells us together the stories that bind us to life. Oh, gee, I wish I'd been born in the age of Homer and I could have had that gig. But, and then I thought, wait a minute, I belong to a tribe. I belong to a community. I belong to a circle of people for whom there is a story that binds us to life. And that's my church. Where's the poetry there? Maybe I can start to write the poems for my church. And that's how this book came out. And that's why I, maybe it was a bit more accessible than some. But I look around this, and I see these beautiful stained glass windows, and they are like the visual aids, the illustrations of some of my poems right here in this book. So I'm going to leave the lectern, and I'm just going to go to, not to all of them, you'll be relieved to hear, but to a few. I'm going to go to some of these windows, have you look at them. And I'm going to read, because these windows, if you look round, they tell the whole story of our salvation. They do. From the Annunciation over there with the angel with Mary, hail thou art highly favoured, all the way through the life of Jesus, the four gospel writers, Jesus with Mary in the garden of resurrection, and then the birth of the church, the sending of the Spirit at Pentecost. It's all there. So, do you want to take a little walk? I'm not saying take a walk with me, get out of the pit, it probably would, could be a problem. But look over, let, let me walk around this church, and let me just find... Some poems from my, um, my sequence that maybe connect. 
with, uh, with these. Let me see. So I'm gonna, now going to have to find, find my poems in the right place on the right days in the year. But uh, let me find my Annunciation poem. Here we are, page 31. Okay, here we are, the angel with Mary. The angels are everywhere, but who stops to see them, eh? Here he is, coming to Mary. This particular image has the angel standing and Mary kneeling. But given what was about to happen, I figured it would be the other way around. Here's my poem on the Annunciation. We see so little stayed on surfaces. We calculate the outsides of all things. Preoccupied with our own purposes, we miss the shimmer of the angels' wings. They coruscate around us in their joy, a swirl of wheels and eyes and wings unfurled. They guard the good we purpose to destroy, a hidden blaze of glory in God's world. But on this day, a young girl stopped to see with open eyes and heart. She heard the voice, the promise of his glory yet to be, as time stood still for her to make a choice. Gabriel knelt and not a feather stirred. The word himself was waiting on her word. She was a free woman. When she spoke that yes, she spoke aloud for every living soul. That's where she's the type of all of us in the end. I always find it a bit difficult. I mean, you know, I belong to a reformed church. We're, you know, we're, we're the Anglican church. We're Catholic, but reformed. But, you know, the Reformation, a lot of great things achieved, especially the translations of the Bible. But I think, you know, when they got rid of all the old things, they were so afraid of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, they accidentally threw out his mother. They didn't, they didn't kind of realize how much she has to teach us about what it is to be Christian. So let's move on to this next one right here. Mary with the baby. What is she doing? She's pointing to Jesus. Frankly, she points to Jesus every time we see her in the Gospels. First miracle at Cana, she says, do what he says. Yeah? She's pointing to him at the cross. I don't think there's any danger of uh, Mary getting in the way of Jesus when it comes to our devotions. That's the last thing she would do. She brought him to us, and she always points towards him. So I want to read to you as I look at that, my thank you poem to Mary. Kind of took me aback when I wrote this, and uh, I'm sure some of the guys in my uh, evangelical college would have wanted to do an intervention on me at this point. <laughs> but I believe, and I mean every word of this poem, it's just called Mary. You bore for me the one who came to bless and bear for all to make the broken whole. You heard his call, and in your open yes, you spoke aloud for every living soul. Oh, gracious lady, child of your own child, whose mother love still calls the child in me, call me again, for I am lost, and wild waves surround me now. On this dark sea, shine as a star and call me to the shore. Open a door that all my sins would close and hold me in your garden. Let me share the prayer that folds the petals of the rose. 
enfold me too in love's last mystery and bring me to the one you bore for me. So, now we, we think about, uh, we've got a beautiful thing here now, haven't we, of um, the Meiji arriving, the three kings. That is an amazing story. The more you read that, the more astonishing it becomes. Don't take it for granted. You read all those genealogies, you know, in the Gospels, and it's so-and-so begat so-and-so and begat so-and-so. It's like a big family story, and guys, it's not our family. <laughs> it's like you're at a party where somebody's invited you and everybody knows everybody else, but you don't belong. And then suddenly, if you're at that party, somebody says your name, and you, oh my goodness. So I'm a Gentile. These guys are Gentiles. They suddenly rock up. They belong there. That's amazing. How did they get in there? Well, Simeon saw it coming. You know, he'll be a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of the people, thy people Israel. I think these guys are our, our proxies right at the beginning of the story. Wait a minute. This is for us. We're from some other place. We don't even have this story. We weren't privileged. I was never privileged to be in that covenant and be one of the chosen people. And boy, do I honor the people that are in that company, the ancient people of Israel and the modern Jewish people. I think that is an astonishing heritage. <laughs> Frankly, I'm a little jealous. <laughs> but as Charles Williams, the friend of C.S. Lewis, said, we're all spiritual Semites. You know, <laughs> we kind of got grafted in there. So here's my one on the Meiji. <sighs> it might have been just someone else's story. Some chosen people get a special king. We leave them to their own peculiar glory. We don't belong. It doesn't mean a thing. But when these three arrive, they bring us with them. Gentiles like us. Their wisdom might be ours. A steady step that finds an inner rhythm. A pilgrim's eye that sees beyond the stars. They did not know his name, but still they sought him. They came from otherwhere, but still they found. In palaces found those who sold and bought him, but in the filthy stable, hallowed ground. Their courage gives our questing hearts a voice to seek, to find, to worship, to rejoice. So, um, we're going to do the grand tour now. I better not, I, yeah, I've got one of Christ in the temple, but we, we can't do it all. Um, <laughs> oh, man. I'm kind of tempted to stop at every window, really, but I know we shouldn't do it. Let's, let's look at the baptism of Jesus, because that is an astonishing thing. The baptism of Jesus is one of the favorite, favorite passages, the baptism of Christ, for the painters and the iconographers. Why? Because you get the whole of the Holy Trinity, don't you, in one frame. You have the Father speaking down, my beloved Son in whom is my delight. You have the Spirit descending as a dove, and you have the Son submitting himself to God in worship. You suddenly have all three. And um, we might say, well, that's, you know, great. Bully for Jesus, you know. He gets to have that special relationship with the Father. Like, man, I'm on the wrong side of the Jordan here, you know. I'm kind of like, uh, that's not for me. And then you realize, wait a minute, I'm baptized into Christ. You're baptized into Christ. At your baptism, when the water's open for you and the dove descends, God says to you, you are my beloved. You are my delight, just as much as he says it to Jesus. He says it to you because you're in Christ and he's in you. So I just feel like there's an invitation there. So here's my, my riff on that. I'm very glad they put the little Trinitarian thing down at the bottom there. That's, um, yeah, that, that, that stained glass window maker knew what they were doing. So, <laughs> so at least you'll be able to say, say at the end of this evening, Great visuals, shame about the poetry, but you know, <laughs> uh, you, know you, you, got, you, you got something here. Something. 
So here we go. The baptism of Christ. Beginning here, we glimpse the three in one. The river runs. The clouds are torn apart. The Father speaks. The Spirit and the Son reveal to us the single loving heart that beats behind the being of all things and calls and keeps and kindles us to light. The dove descends. The Spirit soars and sings, You are beloved. You are my delight. In that swift light and life, as water spills and streams around the man like quickening rain, the voice that made the universe reveals the God in man who makes it new again. He calls us too to step into that river, to die and rise and live and love forever. So there's the baptism of Christ. Um, so are you allowed to twist your necks around? I, uh, I think it's really cool that... Um, They've got the, the four evangelists here. Each of the four evangelists, each with their own sign. There's John with the eagle, and, uh, and uh, yeah, Matthew with the man, Mark with the lion, Luke with the ox. The four figures from the Old Testament who then become the figures in the book of Revelation, the living pillars around the throne, the ones that uphold Jesus. The Gospels are living pillars. They're not dead books. And they've each got their own distinctive thing. They had a reason for picking each of those creatures in relation to the gospel. Why is Matthew the man there? Because, because he gives you the human genealogy. Why is Luke the ox? Because the ox is the servant beast, and Luke really understands the servants and the poor and the outcasts and those who serve. Why is Mark the lion? Because he just pounces right. He doesn't even bother with the Christmas story. He's going like, let's get down to business. The, the, he just leaps out at you from the desert and says, this is it, guys. It's happening now. What is Matthew's favorite adverb? Immediately. Immediately this happened. Why is John the eagle? Because they believed in those days that an eagle could look directly into the light of the sun without being blinded. It didn't have to see the light reflected off anything else could see direct to the source. How does John begin his gospel? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same. It's like the most elated. So I know, just like you're not supposed to have a favorite kid, which you should definitely not do, uh, <laughs> you're kind of not supposed to have a favorite gospel either, but then you kind of do. Uh, and uh, since one of my favorite saints is St. Cuthbert, and his favorite gospel was John, so I figure I'm allowed to have John. I have got, I'm happy to say, poems for all four Gospels. Uh, but I, I'm going to read you the John one. And St. Augustine, writing about John, said, no, there's a little bit more to this than just the eagle seeing the sun. If you think John is just seeing directly into the light of God, you didn't get past, you didn't get up to verse 14 in the pro prologue, did you? Because verse 14 says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he says, the eagle may soar high, but it swoops down upon the body. <laughs> the carne, verbum caro factum est. So I'm trying to get both of those contrasts in this poem. So let's look at John there and the eagle, and I'll read you this one. This is my sonnet for the Gospel of John. John. This is the Gospel of the primal light, the first beginning and the fruitful end the soaring glory of an eagle's flight, the quiet touch of a beloved friend. This is the gospel of our transformation, water to wine and grain to living bread, blindness to sight and sorrow to elation and Lazarus himself back from the dead. This is the gospel of all inner meaning, the heart of heaven open to the earth, a gentle friend on Jesus' bosom leaning, and Nicodemus offered a new birth. No need to search the heavens high above. Come close with John and feel the pulse of love. 
Now, I did that last line because I'm one of those nerdy people who believes that the beloved disciple who leant on Jesus' breast and heard his heartbeat was John. But anyway, that's just my thing. And so come close with John and feel the pulse of love. So let's, let's uh, complete the circuit here. I understand that here in Bristol you have a thing about circuits and going around in circles. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I, I, I hope I'm making good time, you know. Um, so, oh my goodness, the miracle at Cana. I have to say that's my favorite miracle. I mean, what's not to like? Uh, <laughs> you know, we used to have this, we used to have this in, um, in the old, you know, authorized version. And... Um, it would say there were six stone jars of water holding, uh, you know, four or five firkins apiece. And like, I'm a kid at the back, it's like, what is a firkin? <laughs> you know? So somebody finally translates that for me, you know, into gallons and eventually into liters. And I think it comes out at something like 180 liters of good red wine, which is like not bad for a bring a bottle party. <laughs> you know, even, even if the wedding lasts the three days. So, of course, it's so much more than that. It's a miracle of transformation, isn't it? This is the word in whom all things were made. John tells this story, another reason for liking John. I think the prelude, the prologue to John's gospel is not the prologue to chapter one. It's the prologue to every single verse in that gospel. Everything that Jesus ever does in that gospel, he's fully human and he's fully God. The guy doing this is the one in whom and through whom and for whom all things were made. Without him was not anything made that was made, right? He is the in principio. So obviously, he could create ex nihilo, as they say, out of nothing. Because he's like, he's already done that. He could have just, we could have all been sat there with an empty place, bingo, a glass of wine. He doesn't do that. And this is the first of, John doesn't call them miracles, you know that. He, the, word, the Greek word is same, a sign. This is the first of the signs he did and revealed his glory. So everything is significant. He doesn't say, hey, I'm God, chill. He, he says, what have you got? Bring me what you've got. What they had was water. Do you remember what the water was for? Those six stone jars. It was for the outer purification. It was for the washing it was for just, I've got to cleanse myself and look good on the outside. Nobody drank it. He takes the waters of out of cleansing and turns them into wine, which, as the scripture says, makes glad the heart of man. So here's my take on, um, on my favorite miracle. Here's an epiphany to have and hold, a truth that you can taste upon the tongue. No distant shrines or canopies of gold or ladders to be clambered rung by rung. But here and now, amidst your daily living, where you can taste and touch and feel and see, the spring of love, the fount of all forgiving, flows when you need it, rich, abundant, free, better than waters of some outer weeping that leave you still with all your hidden sin. Here is a vintage, richer for the keeping, that works its transformation from within. What price, you ask me, as we raise the glass? It cost our Savior everything he has. Because that's the thing about that story, isn't it? Going back to Mary. She goes up to him and says, they have no wine. And he's really quite shocked. And he goes, woman, gunai. It's like a, quite a harsh word to say to your mum. You know, I wouldn't get away with that. Uh, <laughs> so, woman, what has that to do with me? Then what does he say? My hour has not yet come. Do you know what this means, mum? <laughs> That's my heart's blood. What price, you ask me, as we raise the glass? cost our saviour everything he has. So, um, let's just go here and then end with some good news in the morning. I, um, I'd written my sonnets on the, on the O Advent antiphons and I didn't know if I was going to write any more. 
And this woman in our church who was training for ministry, and she had to go off to her new parish. She was about to be ordained. She, she came up to me and said, okay, Malcolm, so when are you going to, you've done the, the 7 Advent Antiphons. When are you going to do the 14 Stations of the Cross? Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> and I thought, oh, 14 Stations, 14 lines. Uh, no, that's not going to work. So I wrote 14 and indeed 15 sonnets, trying to come close to the mystery, trying to walk slowly with Jesus on the Via Dolorosa. But I'm just going to read you one of them. Um, I'm going to read you the one for Jesus is nailed to the cross. It's the 11th station. I kind of tried to say something of what I think this means to me. See, as they strip the robe from off his back and spread his arms and nail them to the cross, the dark nails pierce him and the sky turns black and love is firmly fastened onto loss. But here, a pure change happens. On this tree, Loss becomes gain. Death opens into birth. Here, wounding heals and fastening makes free. Earth breathes in heaven. Heaven roots in earth. And here we see the length, the breadth, the height where love and hatred meet and love stays true. Where sin meets grace, and darkness turns to light. We see what love can bear and be and do. And here, our Savior calls us to his side. His love is free. His arms are open wide. And uh, we'll just do... Way off schedule here, but there you go. Um, woman, why weepest thou? Again, I have to say, the guy that gives this best is John. <laughs> just, just, just saying. Uh, <laughs> he's the one who tells us about how all the others were running around, frankly, running around like headless chickens. They had no idea what they're doing. Oh, look, he's here. No, he's not here. All oh, the clothes are... And then they, they go. They, like, run away before the action has even started. But Mary stood by the sepulcher and wept. And it was because she had the courage to stay and weep and not cover up the tears that she got to be asked the question, woman, why are you weeping? And you know that beautiful thing where she thinks he's the gardener? Lancelot Andrews, the great Anglican preacher who inspired Eliot, he said there's never a mistake about Jesus in the Gospels. Even when people think they're mistaken, or even when they think they're doing some cynical thing, God can make it true, like it's expedient that one man dies for the people. Too right it is. <laughs> so she mistook him for the gardener. He was the gardener. All this got lost in a garden. Now it's going to be found again in a garden. He planted the Garden of Eden. But Andrew says he was more than a gardener. Look, there was the field of her heart, wintry, ripped open, scarred by grief, and with one word, this is, I'm quoting Andrews now, with one word, he makes all green again, just by saying her name. So I was kind of riffing on Andrews a bit when I wrote this. This is my 15th station, Easter dawn. He blesses every love that weeps and grieves, and now he blesses hers, who stood and wept and would not be consoled or leave her love's last touching place, but watched as low light crept up from the east. A sound behind her stirs a scatter of bright birdsong through the air. She turns, but cannot focus through her tears or recognize the gardener standing there. She hardly hears his gentle question, Why? Why are you weeping? or sees the play of light that brightens as she chokes out her reply, they took my love away. My day is night. And then she hears her name. 
she hears love say the word that turns her night and ours today. So um, I'm finally going to get back to my, my lectern and my watch, and <laughs> you can check how I'm doing on time. But I can't forego Pentecost, one of my favorite feasts. You know, um, it's such an amazing combination of things. But I'm most interested in that beautiful gift of translation. I mean, people talk about lost in translation. This is the day when we're found in translation. But um, also, you know, I was really, I'm really interested in, in the kind of underlying motifs of things. And I thought it's really interesting that um, when we speak of the Holy Spirit, three of the four ancient elements out of which the whole earth, the whole of the cosmos was meant to be made, are mentioned. So you know the four elements are earth, air, water, and fire, yeah? So obviously, air, breath, spiritus, that it means, the wind blow with listeth, yeah? The fire of the divine love, the flowing water of the fountain playing, they're all symbols of the spirit. I was thinking, so like, what about earth? Where does earth come in? <laughs> and then I thought, wait a minute, that's our name. You know what, that Adam in Hebrew means red earth, red clay, person of clay. But it's just dry as dust without the air and the fire and the water. So it's kind of, so that sort of comes into this as well. So this is just called Pentecost. Today we feel the wind beneath our wings. Today the hidden fountain flows and plays. Today the church brought, draws breath at last and sings as every flame becomes a tongue of praise. This is the feast of fire, air, and water poured out and breathed and kindled into earth. The earth herself awakens to her maker, translated out of death and into birth. The right words come today in their right order, and every word spells freedom and release. Today, the gospel crosses every border. All tongues are loosened by the Prince of Peace. Today, the lost are found in his translation, whose mother tongue is love in every nation. So there's a little quick tour of the church there. Um, um, how am I doing? Oh, man. I've got five minutes left, you know. <laughs> Before, so maybe we should have a song at this point. Um, just to justify my being in the birthplace of country music. I wonder if that's going to work. So I've only read from, from one of the books. I brought five books. <laughs> Never mind. Um, but I just couldn't resist it. That was a spontaneous thing. I just thought those windows were so beautiful. <laughs> I thought we, we kind of have to do that, really. Um, so, um, uh, I'm going to do a, uh, maybe it's a bit of a confession, this song. Um, I read you that poem, The Singing Bowl, didn't I, about be still, be centered, empty yourself, you know, and you're thinking, wow, that guy is really zen-like. Uh, of course, the reason why I wrote that poem is not because I do it, because I don't do it. I need the, I need the poem to tell me. People sometimes write to me because my books have been out there for a while and they think there's some wisdom in the poetry. And they assume, hey, whoa, like I'll go to the guy, you'll be able to. And I say, I'm sorry, you've already had the best, you know. I needed this stuff, that's why I wrote it. Not because I had it, but because I needed it. So uh, this is a song um, called Lente, Lente. And again, it's a bit of advice to self. I had a friend who, who realized I was overdoing things and she was trying to slow me down. And Lente, Lente is Italian, you know, which goes back to Latin, means slowly, gently, gently. And this, this woman, she, she, she was a gardener, a professional gardener in one of the Cambridge colleges. And when she wasn't gardening in winter, she made felt. She made beautiful felt objects, and she spent ages, like, 
teasing and combing out the felt, and her, her felt-making company was just herself and a friend, was called Lente Lente, anyway. So she did get through to me and going like, Lente Lente. So, uh, so I just thought I'd better, better remind myself I put this in a song. I mean, you could even join in the Lente Lente bits at the end. I varied a bit. I've been running from the past And I've been living way too fast But I'm coming home at last Home to take it slow and gently Lente, lente Lente, lente, lente Slow down pedal Learn to take it gently Lente, lente Lente, lente, lente Just don't do so much on the run Step aside, let's have some fun Here's a friendship just begun We're gonna take it slow and gently You wanna sing Lente, Lente with me? Lente, Lente Lente, Lente, Lente She said, close your eyes Close your eyes and Count to twenty. <laughs> Sing with me. Lente, lente. Lente, lente, lente. Let's take time to gather wool. Gently tease and softly pull. When the harvest moon is full And the felts are forming gently Lente, lente Lente, lente, lente Let me gaze, let me gaze on you intently Lente, lente, lente My ears are ringing like empty shells My heart lies open like the book of cows And I'll draw sweet water from deep wells When I learn to draw it gently Lente, lente Lente, lente, lente For we have world We have world and time aplenty Lente, lente Lente, lente, lente Cause all those guys who set the pace Without a trace, but we'll taste a different kind of grace when we learn to take it gently. Lente, 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 lente. Close your eyes, close your eyes, count to twenty. Lente, 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 lente. Let me gaze, let me gaze on you intently. Lente, 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 lente. Okay.
Okay. So I, um, I think I have time to do a request. Martin had a request um, for, uh, he wanted, I think he wanted me to do this song, but I don't think I'm capable of the chords. But I wrote, I wrote a poem called Descent, and it was, it was called Descent, which happens to be spelt D-E-S-C-E-N-T, to descend, descent. But I kind of wanted it to be heard also as dissent, disagreement. And because I imagined it as God saying to us about our ridiculously high-pointing religious structures and our spiritual high-jumping and our, our kind of construction of ludicrous towers of works, you know, to get us a little bit closer to heaven. If only we sing this chorus the 15th time, God will finally hear us, whatever it is. Or if the, it's you know, like we get a perfect high C or what, you know. And God is saying, I dissent from that. <laughs> I have another idea. The poem actually turns on a contrast between what was happening religiously in the great Roman Empire in the time that Jesus was born. I was thinking about the Olympian gods, the great gods up there, the beautiful, the Parthenon and the chiseled marbles and everything. And then I was thinking about the messy stable floor. Um, my friend Steve Bell, the Canadian singer-songwriter, set this to music, and he can sing it better than I am. I can't do the high oohs in his song. I originally wrote it as a three-verse a three verse poem, and Steve said, no, for the way I've set it to music, I need some more verses. So he was staying around at mine and said, get down to your hut, Malcolm, and do the job. So I, like, I wrote some more verses, and the more verses really changed the poem and made it better. So, so that's how collaboration works. So this is, this is for Martin. And it's called Descent. They sought to soar into the skies, those classic gods of high renown, for lofty pride aspires to rise. But you came down. You dropped down from the mountain sheer, forsook the eagle for the dove. The other gods demanded fear, but you gave love. Where chiseled marble seemed to freeze their abstract and perfected form, compassion brought you to your knees. Your blood was warm. They called for blood in sacrifice and victims on their altars bled when no one else could pay the price. You died instead. They towered above our mortal plane, dismissed this restless flesh with scorn aloof from birth and death and pain. But you were born, born to these burdens, born by all, born with us all, astride the grave, weak to be with us when we fall, and strong to save. So uh, it's kind of a take on my faith, such as it is. Um, so we've definitely come to the end of the time. I'm just going to close with one other poem, which will, um, will take the form of confession, you know, because confession is good for the soul. Actually, it's very funny. I read this poem in Martin's class earlier on today, and he didn't know it was coming, right? And literally, just before I read it, he said, is there anything you want me to photocopy? Now... The poem is called On Being Told My Poetry Was Found in a Broken Photocopier. <laughs> and, like, it is a confession about how I totally destroyed the photocopier in a college one time. So I paused, and he literally went out and photocopied this poem. So before I read you the poem, maybe I should just set it up for you a little bit. So I was giving a talk on poetry in a college, and, like, I was supposed to illustrate it with my own poems and stuff. And, like, I hadn't got all the handouts together. So um, I figured I'll just go and do the photocopying. Like, either it'll be one of those really simple machines that I understand, like from my youth, when it was a photocopy, it was about this size. You just lifted up the thing, you put your thing down on the glass, you closed it, and there's one button, and it helpfully says, copy. <laughs> and you press it. And I thought, well, if it's not like that, if it's any more complicated, you know, there'll be some kind person to, to help me out. So I get there, and I go into the photocopying room just near the hall where I'm giving the lecture. And I could not believe this thing I saw. There's this huge machine, right? And it's not, it's not even clear which is the front end and which is the back end. It's got trays on either side. 
sticking out like that. It looks more like a Hindu goddess than a photocopier. <laughs> I'm like, what is this? And there's nobody there to help me at all. And like the bell is going to go for the lecture. So I just like pick the biggest tray on one side that, you know, I put the poems in and I piss, you know, push the biggest button and hope for the best. And amazingly, these wheels were, and the poems got sucked into the machine. I thought, well, this is good. And then there was a whirring sound. And then some other poems started coming out the other side. So I thought, well, this is great. You know? And then suddenly there was this just horrible, horrible grinding, graunching, kind of mashing sound. And the whole thing ground to a halt. And then these lights started flashing with messages. Like, I had no idea these things could write or talk. And it says, like, jam in level C, you know. <laughs> It says, open door A, so I open door A, and then another sign says, find knob D, you know, and you turn it, loose. I'm trying to do this, and it's just a mess, and there's all my stuff stuck in the machine, and, um, and I, the bell was going, so like, I just took whatever I could that had actually come out, the photocopy, my inadequate handouts went out, I gave my talk, you know, and um, of course, I had to come back past this room, so as I feared, you know, I was walking back past this room meekly, and this woman comes out with one of my poems in her hand, like crumpled up, and she points a finger at me, and she says, your poetry is jamming my machine. <laughs> and I thought, that's such a great line. <laughs> that's fantastic. Like, it's even iambic pentameter, your poetry is jamming my machine. Yeah, obviously I didn't say that. I said, like, I'm terribly sorry, I didn't quite know what to do, and she, do please show me. So she brings me in, and we open up. We literally knelt in front of this machine, you know, trying to pull all this stuff out, and she showed me what knob C was and tray A and how I should have done it and everything. We eventually got the last shred of my poetry out of the machine, and I apologized again and sort of went meekly on my way. But I just kind of looked over my shoulder and looked back, and I noticed as I was leaving that um, she was uncrumpling one of my poems and reading it. So I thought, oh, that's good. Um, I think this woman deserves a poem. So I wrote her this poem, which is snappily entitled On Being Told My Poetry Was Found in a Broken Photocopy. And um, I decided for the form of the poem that I would use the villanelle. The villanelle, as you may know, is a poem that has repeated lines. Like the two lines that come up in the first verse get alternating at the end of each of all the other verses, and then they come together again in the last verse. You probably know... Uh, the most famous villanelle, probably, certainly of the 20th century. I mean, it was invented in France in the Middle Ages, but the most famous one is probably the Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old men should burn and rage at close of day. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. And, you know, it alternates those two lines all the way through, and it finishes uh, to his father, you know. You, my father, there on that sad height, bless. Curse me with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So it's a great form. And obviously, after that, like, why even bother? You know, <laughs> so you should do it like... But nevertheless, I thought I'm going to do a villanelle. Why? Because that is a form of poetry that quite literally photocopies itself. It like, <laughs> you know... Plus, to write a good... It's hard, quite difficult technique because you've only got two rhyme sounds. But frankly, to write a good villanelle, you only need two good lines. Like, the rest is filler. You just have to make sure you've got really good lines. And this woman had already given me one of them, you know. So I, I thought, you know, uh, so this is how it came out, and I'll close with this one. And we can have some time for questions. Right. So it's a kind of confession. On being told my poetry was found in a broken photocopy. My poetry is jamming your machine. It broke the photocopy. I'm to blame. With pictures copied from a world unseen. My poem is in the works, I'm on the scene. We free my verse and I confess my shame. My poetry is jamming your machine. Though you berate me with what might have been, you stop to read the poem just the same. And pictures copied from a world unseen subvert the icons on your mental screen and open windows with a whispered name. My poetry is jamming your machine, for chosen words can change the things they mean and set the once familiar world aflame with pictures copied from a world unseen. The mental props give way on which you lean. The world you see will never be the same. My poetry is jamming your machine with pictures copied from a world unseen. Thank you for listening.
so, so hopefully we have a little time for just uh, responses, questions and answers, requests, uh, whatever. Yeah. Did the she not only had a chance to read it, you know, I, I had to go back to that controversy. She said, oh, I love the poem. And then she pointed to me silently. You know, in every reprographics or photocopying room, there's always that tatty notice board in the corner which has all the notices about copyright and what you shouldn't do, which nobody ever reads. She stuck it up there. <laughs> and I've been back. It's still up there. It's right up there. The, yeah, yeah. So, yes, yeah, she did, I think. I think it's not... If you're a hard-pressed secretary, it's not every day you get a poem, so I think she, she mentioned it, you know. Yeah, so, sorry. Right. Um, thank you. Anybody else? You don't have to ask anything. You, know, you can... Yeah. Well, I started having a go after that story I told you about being in Keats' house. I went home and like read loads of Keats and tried to write poems like Keats, but I couldn't do it. So I started trying when I was about 16 or 17. Had a big burst when I was young. And then, you know, I went to college where they try to beat it out of you and, you know, they analyze it to death and everything. But so it kind of went... And then it started again a bit later. Then, then I went to get ordained and that was lovely, but it was very, very hard work and toiling in the vineyard. And then when I came back to university life, I thought, I have to get this stuff together. So I began to write much more seriously then. But it was a long time till I published. I didn't publish really till I was about 50. So I had a few poems in magazines before then. But I listened to poetry and I read poetry all my life. And it's when you listen to poetry and love it, that's when you want to start writing. Thank you, it's a very good question. Yeah. I think um, it's to do with uh, the, the act of compression forces you to look to what's essential. You know, there is a real sense that kind of less is more in that sense. I think there's a danger in our tendency to expand and abstract, especially when the language becomes abstract. And I think the limitations of a poem are part of its beauty, of the form, the, the kind of bounding line. Obviously, some things require longer discourse than others. But if you think about the parables of Jesus or just the directly, the direct sayings, you know, um, you know, seek and you will find, you know, ask and you will be given, knock and the door will be opened to you. They're very, very simple things. So I'm always slightly wary of um, abstractions and repetitions, but... Um, Though I do recognize that there are some things that require long technical work, and that's fine. But some of the writers I most admire could read huge masses of English literature and then just condense it down beautifully. C.S. Lewis would be an example of that, you know. His preface to Paradise Lost is not the longest literary critical book on Milton by any measure, but it is easily the best. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that question. Yep. Uh, with the uh, quickly changing technology for writing, uh, whether poetry, whatever, and then, you know, uh, recording it, keeping it, uh, filing it, and work, do you still write the same uh, manner, the same method, the same? Yeah, method? that's a very good question. Do do? I do a mixture. I like pens, I like old notebooks. I like to write. There's something about the rhythm of that. C.S. Lewis not only wrote with a pen, but he wrote with a dip pen, not even a fountain pen, even in the age of the typewriter, because he used to think that, he said the rhythm of dipping in the pen and then bringing it back gave him pause for thought. And I was just in the Wade Centre this, on this trip just a week or two ago, looking at some, I saw the manuscript. I held in my hand C.S. Lewis's handwritten manuscript for several pages of his reflections on the Psalms. Must have been about three pages I read. There were two crossings out. And the rest of it had just, it's gorgeous prose. He's dipping away. So I like the pens. Having said that, 
I find some aspects of technology incredibly helpful. I do a lot of walking. I compose while I'm walking. I try and remember. I find it incredibly useful to use the memo on my phone when two or three lines come to me to speak into it. I also use the transcribe thing so it appears in my notes. I use the note function on my phone because I know that it'll then appear magically on my computer and I can work with that. So I have a lot of drafts of poems and it's very easy to organize them. The difficulty with that though, as I've discovered, which is why I also write in manuscript books, is when you write a draft and you reject a line and you write something else, you put a, a line through it, but it's still perfectly legible. And it may be that hidden in that line that was not good for that moment is a bit of a gem that you could set somewhere else in the structure. But when you're doing it on the computer, you deleted it, that's it, it's gone. So I go back and forth, but I kind of like to, I also, I once had the experience of buying some book on Kindle or whatever it was, and there was some copyright issue with it with the publisher, and I looked for it and it just disappeared. They literally had the technology to take it out of my library. And I thought, that does not bode well. I'm going to have paper copies of everything that's important because I don't want any, any firm or agency going into my library and telling me what I can't read. You know, so I, I'm going to have the paper copy. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a mix of things. I mean, printing was a new technology and everyone's going, but I can, imagine, I can imagine the guys with the scrolls going like, oh, this new codex thing, that's terrible. You see the kids, they've got their noses in books. They're flipping around. They don't, they don't understand. Look, you've got to scroll down because then you're seeing the whole thing. Like, it's, that's terrible what the kids are doing these days. You can imagine that, you know. And then some guy that's written an epic and saying, this Shakespeare sonnet thing, like compressing it into 14 lines. Like, what can you learn from that, you know? In my days, we read epics, you know, the concentration span of youth these days. You know, so there's always going to be that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have tons of them. I just happened, I guess maybe because I was in a church and I just loved the windows. I happened to do. So, I'm curious if you have a book like that. Yeah, so I've got a, my book, The Singing Bowl, is full of all kinds of poetry. It's got love poetry. It's got poetry about my travels. It's not all by any means explicitly religious poetry. It has got poems about the saints I love, but it's... Um, it's got all kinds of st stuff. That's, that's like my book after prayer starts with some poems about um, about uh, a poem of George Herbert's. But then I've got poems on everything. I've got a, a lament for the death of Leonard Cohen. I've got a poem about my little shed that I write in. I've got a poem about the time I got I had a there was a cancer scare. And I had to do these really major scans, and I wrote this poem called "How to Scan a Poet," because <laughs> because. I like the word scan on scansion. Maybe I should just read you that. Just, uh, here's, here's, here's just a different thing, okay. So this is called How to Scan a Poet. They give you this thing, leaflet before they do all these scanning, you know. And it, I noticed, I read the leaflet and it said, it had the words image, contrast, and resonance in it. <laughs> Deep resonance. I thought, well, okay, I can do this. <laughs> so, How to Scan a Poet. My doctor tells me I will need a scan. I tap a nervous rhythm with my feet. Just count to five, she says, and then sit down. The gist of it is printed on this sheet, so read it over when you're at home. We'll have a clearer picture when we meet. I read the letter in the waiting room. It's language strangely rich for one like me. Image, contrast, resonance. A poem slips into view amidst the litany of Latin terms that make our medicine a new poetic terminology. The door is opened. I am ushered in to lisp my list of symptoms, to rehearse the undiscovered art of naming pain. It's called deep inspiration, says the nurse. Draw deep for me, then simply hold your breath and stay composed. So I compose this verse. <laughs> she says, we die for contrast, to unearth each hidden image, which might bring some clue that takes us closer to the truth. Be still, and I will pass you through the ring, three passes all in rhythm, and you're free. The resonance will show us everything. And now, 
My muse says much the same to me, scanning these lines and calling me to sing. So it's about MRI scanners. Yeah, so the next book I'm working on is a big book of poems, ballad poems, about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. So that's going to be a whole different gig. In fact, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you care to read any poem that you like about the wonderful art of smoking from a pipe? About the art of? Uh, smoking from a pipe. Oh, smoking from a pipe. Yeah, I've got a few of those. I better. I even have my. I probably can't smoke in here, but I'll. I'll read you. I'll read you my poem, since it's the one that's printed. I've got some others unprinted, but this one is called "Smoke Rings from My Pipe," and it's in the ballad form, which was invented by Villon. So it's got a repeating line. You've got to imagine me with my pipe here. And I'm going, my briar pipe. Smoke rings from my pipe. All the long day's weariness is done. I'm free at last to do just as I will. Take out my pipe, admire the setting sun, practice the art of simply sitting still. Thank God I have this briar bowl to fill. I leave the world with all its hopeless hype, its pressures and its ever ringing till, and let it go in smoke rings from my pipe. The hustle and the bustle, these I shun. The tasks that trouble and the cares that kill. The false idea that there's a race to run. The pushing of the weary stone uphill. The wretched iPhone's all insistent trill. Whingers and whiners, each with their own gripe. I Pack them in tobacco leaves until they're blown away in smoke rings from my pipe. And then, at last, my real work has begun. My chance to chant, to exercise the skill of summoning the muses one by one, to meet me in their temple, touch my quill. I have a pen, but quills are better still. And when the soul is full, the time is right. Kindle the fire of poetry that will breathe and expand like smoke rings from my pipe. Prince, I have done with grinding at the mill. These petty, pelting tyrants aren't my type. So lift me up and set me on a hill, a free man blowing smoke rings from his pipe. Thank you for the request. It's uh, always... Send that out to... Uh, to the Brotherhood of the Briar. Maybe, um, so was another, I was going to say, maybe I should close with a, a little taste of what might be to come, not published yet. This is the kind of prologue poem, or proem, you might say, to my forthcoming <laughs> epic about King Arthur. And it's about the feeling that, yeah, I should write this poem now. Like, why should I, what, what, and it's about my love of England and my sense of the magic of the land, the sense that the story's still there somewhere, that it needs to be told again, and that when we tell that story, we move a veil away, and there's a lot more beauty and awe and magic around us than we realise. So I'll finish with this. This is just called Take Up the Tale. As I walked out one morning, all in the soft, fine rain, it seemed as though a silver veil was shining over hill and vale, as though some lovely long-lost spell had made all new again. And through that shimmer in the air, I seemed to hear a sound, as though a distant horn were blown in some lost land that I had known that seemed to speak from tree and stone and echo all around. And with the music came these words, Poet, take up the tale. Take up the tale this land still keeps. In earth and water magic sleeps. The dryad sighs, the naiad weeps, but you can lift the veil. From where the waves wash Cornwall's caves out to the white horse vale, the land still hold the tales of old, like hidden treasure, buried gold. Once more the story must be told. Poet, take up the tale. Tell of the king 
who will return. Tell of the Holy Grail. Tell of old knights and chivalry. Tell of the pristine mystery of Merlin's Isle of Grammary. Poet, take up the tale. Take up the tale of courtesy. Take up the tale of grace. Revive the land's long memory. Summon the fair folk. Let them be. Something of fairy, wild and free, still lingers in this place. Lift up your eyes to see the light on Glastonbury tall. Then come down from that far green hill to where the sacred waters spill and shine within the chalice well and listen to their law. Yea, listen well ere you begin. Be still, be listen well before you start. Be still ere you begin. See through the surface round about the noise, the rush, the fear, the doubt. Though modern Britain lies without, Fair Logres lives within. You may yet walk through Merlin's Isle by oak and ash and thorn. The ancient hills do not forget, and you might wake their wisdom yet. Who knows what wonders might be met on this midsummer morn? So, I have taken up the tale to tell it full and free. The tale that makes my heart rejoice, I tell it, for I have no choice. I tell it till another voice takes up the tale from me. So that's what's to come. to do, let me remind you uh, that tomorrow morning Malcolm will be speaking at 9.15 in the King College Chapel. I'd love to see some of you there if you have the chance. Uh, let me remind you that on Sunday we discuss Frederick Buechner's The Sacred Journey and on Monday we will have Jeff Monroe tell us about uh, Fred's life and legacy. Um, Fred and Malcolm share something in common, which is they give us words as agents of grace that can carry truth and beauty and wonder to one another, and we live in an age in which words are missiles sent mm. to harm. Yeah. And it's a wonderful healing experience to share an evening with Malcolm Guide. Please join me. Oh, and also, lest I, I was, that was a great segue, and then I remember the other thing. This is the way my announcements go. I have the great rhetorical flourish, and then it suddenly crashes into the mundane again. Um, don't forget the books. So if you want books, you walk through the downstairs hallway this way. You purchase the books from Ivy and you can bring them back in here, and Malcolm will be here in the front lingering for a good while. So uh, thank you for being here tonight. Please join me again in thanking Malcolm Guyton.